Hi folks, it's Dr. P. I want to go over a bunch of different troubleshooting things that you can do to get your digital systems projects to work. So there's a bunch of things that I commonly see that are done um, in circuit after circuit. So I'm going to attempt to get the biggest things that I see, but this is by all means not exhaustive. And I want to point out again that the most the best, the most efficient way to get better at this is to just practice, 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 practice. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to understand what our circuit is supposed to do. And only then can we diagnose problems with our circuit. So here I have a very simple circuit. It's an AND gate. Um, but really what I should do when I have a circuit in front of me is I should have a truth table and I should have a pin outer schematic diagram because I need to know how to wire this up properly. So let's say that this is my circuit and I'm happy with it and I want to check to see if things are working. Knowing how the truth table works, when both inputs are zero, the LED should be off and that's the case. When one or the other, but not both of the inputs are one, the LED should be off and when both inputs are one, the LED should be on. So you can see that that is not the case here. So this comes to the first thing that I like to kind of go over, which is, is it my circuit or is it my LED? Now, this is a pretty simple chip, very simple circuit for me to try to troubleshoot problems with, but let's assume that I had a really like huge rat's nest of things going on here, lots of chips, lots of wires. Let's say that my LED is not lighting up when I expect it to it would take me a lot more effort to diagnose the chip problems than it would for me to diagnose the LED problems. So we want to see if the LED is going to work. A good thing to check to see if the LED is going to work or not, after you verify the fact that it is correctly connected through a current limiting resistor to ground and to your signal, so everything's in the correct row, the LED's not shorted, is just to take the wire that would be giving us our output signal and connect it directly to power. And that doesn't solve the problem. So probably my circuit's not wrong, probably it's the LED. So then what we can do is we can put a second LED in there. Now I'm gonna assume that this second LED is good, but you know, that's also a gamble that I'm taking. And when I stick that other LED in here, the LED lights up. So in fact, this green LED, I purposefully melted about 10 minutes ago so that it would not work. Um, so I could have spent a long time diagnosing this when it would actually wind up being the LED that's bad. So anytime we're using a type of output device, whether it be an LED or something more complicated like a segmented display, you should always first verify that your output device works. Make sure that your LED is working. When we start working with seven segment displays, we'll see that there's a lamp test signal that you can use that forces all of the segments to light up. By doing that, we can verify that our output device works. Once again, we have a very simple AND gate, and I want to verify that my circuit is working properly. So again, when both of my inputs are zero, the LED should be off. And either one, but not both, of my inputs is one, my LED should be off. And when both of the inputs are one, my LED should be on. Okay, so again, this is not working. So let me validate that my LED works. So my LED is perfectly good. So what I've done here is I've diagnosed the problem is somewhere with my circuit. It's not with my output device. This is where I like to use my logic analyzer, my logic probe. Okay, this is gonna be a very, very useful tool. Remember on our logic probe, we want it to be on TTL mode and we want it to be on pulse mode. Okay, so TTL, pulse. So what I like to do is I like to check both of the inputs and I like to check the outputs. So if I check the inputs, now let's check it for the situation in which I know my output is not working well. So both of my inputs are ones right now. I verify it on the resistor. I verify them on the breadboard and I verify them on the pins. Now I wanna check the output. And when I check the output, I'm actually getting a float. I'm not getting a one, I'm not getting a zero. So this might be where I want to check the pinout diagram. Let's take a look at the pinout diagram for a 7408 chip. 
we've got our input pins in the correct position. We've got our output pin positioned properly. Now there are power and ground connections that we must connect to a chip. If I check the pin for my ground connection on pin 7, that's good. When I check the pin for my power connection on pin 14, I get that float again. It turns out that my power wire is actually offset by a row on my breadboard. Once I move that power connection to the correct spot, then my LED turns on. This is a very common problem that students have. Either this is completely missing, or it's just offset by a row. Notice how we determined that by realizing that there was a floating condition on the output. Whenever there's a floating condition on the output, it probably means that either the power or the ground connections are not properly placed. By checking the pins or the rows on the breadboards, we can help to kind of quickly determine whether or not those have been placed. Remember, the power and ground connections are never optional. They are mandatory. Anytime we want a logic gate to work, we must include them. In this circuit, I have a much more subtle difficulty with my output. So rather than having an AND gate connected, now I have an OR gate connected. So this is the 7432 chip. And again, anytime I check a circuit, I should know how I expect it to work. Because knowing exactly what's not happening that I expect to be happening, or what's happening that I don't expect to be happening is necessary for troubleshooting. If I don't know what the circuit is supposed to do, then I can't fix it. So here, what I should expect is that anytime at least one of the inputs is a one, that my LED should turn on. So otherwise, my LED should be off. So it starts out off, that's great. Whenever I have one of the inputs on, the LED lights up. And then I'm hoping that this is adequately portrayed on this uh, video recording. But what happens when I flip my second input on is that the LED becomes dim. Okay, now the LED becoming dim is something that students usually don't think is a problem because, hey, the LED is on. This is a pernicious problem that might not look like an issue here, but if I were to take this output and cascade it into other chips, I don't know that it would necessarily work properly. So again, what I wanna do is I wanna probe my inputs and my outputs on my logic chip, and I wanna consult my pinout diagram to make sure that my power and ground connections are good. So both of my inputs are one, which I can validate from the dip switch, on the breadboard, and on the pins. My output should also be a one. Okay, I'm probing the output pin, and I'm actually getting a floating signal. Or, I'm not really getting a float, but what's happening here, if I had a, an analog measuring tool, is I guarantee you that I would get some voltage coming out of here, but not quite enough. Or something else kind of weird is happening here. So what's going on? So I'm gonna check my power connection on pin 14, and I'm gonna check my ground connection. Oh, but wait, my ground connection is reading as a high. And as it turns out, my ground pin, my ground connection is actually offset by one row on my breadboard. And when I move that, now I don't have that dim LED anymore. I see dim LEDs frequently, 99.99% of the time, that there's a dim LED, it's a ground problem somewhere. It's either a problem with a pull-down resistor or it's a problem with the actual chip itself being grounded. So anytime you see a dim LED, immediately you should think, hey, there's a ground connection that is incorrect or improperly placed somewhere here on my circuit. Okay, once again, we have an OR gate wired up here and we wanna make sure that it works. We know what our truth table says for how it should work, and I know that anytime at least one of my inputs is a one, that my output should be a one. So when I check one of the outputs, or, or one of the inputs being one is good, but when both of the inputs are on, the LED turns off. So what are the things we've discussed so far? We want to make sure that our inputs are connected, our output is connected, our power and ground is connected to our chip, and that we don't have any issues with bent pins. I'm gonna probe my inputs, they're both high. Probing the breadboard, they're both high. Probing the pins, they're both high. So none of my input pins are bent. My output pin 
However, is reading a zero both on the LED, on the breadboard, and on the chip. This means the pin isn't bent, it means the wire isn't bad. I'm probing the pins and the breadboard for my power and ground connections. Those are all as they should be. So everything here looks nominal. What's the issue then? Well, the issue here is that I'm using the wrong chip. This is the 7486 chip, which is an XOR gate. This is not an OR gate chip. I have to tell you that I've seen students spend upward of several hours trying to diagnose problems with a circuit, and the result just turned out to be that they were using the wrong chip. So always be careful in reading the numbers on your chips. I'm going to include here a list of the most commonly used chips that we're going to use in this class, just so that you can have it as a reference. But remember that this information is on my website on the inventory of parts link. That's what you're going to want to use. It's also in the back of your lab manual in the appendix. Okay, so all of this information about which chip corresponds to what logic gate should be very readily accessible to you at all times. Once again, I have an OR gate hooked up here. So this is the 7432 chip. Here's my dip switch. And I notice right off the bat that this is not what I would expect. Both of my inputs are off and my LED is turned on. So again, the best way to deal with something like this is with the logic probe. So I'm gonna probe my inputs. And those are both reading as a low, which I expect. So then I'm going to put the probe into the rows on the breadboard. And that tells me that the wire's good. Okay, so the wire is good, but then what I want to do is I want to probe the actual pin itself. So I'm getting a zero input here, but when I probe the second input pin, I'm getting a float. Why is it that I get a signal here, but no signal on the chip itself? What happens is if I were to take this out and hold it upside down, I would notice that there's actually a pin that is broken. Okay, so a pin here is actually bent. It was physically moved out of place. So it's possible that I could bend it back, but these things cost about 30 cents each, so it's probably easier to just throw it away and get a new chip. Okay, so a broken or a bent pin can be difficult to diagnose once you've put a chip into the breadboard. For that reason, it's very, very important that you check your dip chips after you take them out of your kit and before you put them into your breadboard every single time. Failure to do that might mean that you miss a broken pin. Notice how the only way to check for a broken pin once I actually inserted this into my breadboard was to both probe the actual row on the breadboard itself and also the corresponding pin on the chip. If those two signals don't match, it means that the signal is not getting to this chip somehow. The same thing could happen if an output pin is not connected. If my output pin were bent, then I'd be getting a signal from the chip, but no signal on the breadboard. This is a very, very difficult problem to diagnose. So again, the logic probe is really the only way to determine that without physically removing the chip from the breadboard. Make sure you always inspect your chips before you put them into your breadboard. Here's a slightly more complicated circuit. What I have here is a three input AND gate wired up as a combination of two input AND gates using the 7408 chip. We already did this in one of our labs, so you know how it works. Nonetheless, I still want to have a truth table and a schematic diagram next to me so that I can verify that things are working as they should. I know that the only way to get this LED to turn on should be to have all three of my inputs as a one. So I'm going to check each of the different situations. And I notice that with inputs one and zero as, a, or excuse me, A and C as a one, and input B as a zero, that I'm getting my LED to turn on. I would not expect this. Uh, in fact, it's wrong. What should happen is the LED should be off right here. So again, what I need to do is I need to use my logic probe. I need to probe the inputs. I need to probe my chip to see what's going on. So if I check input A, it's a one as it should be. When I check input B, it's also a one, which doesn't really make any sense because this dip switch is positioned off. When I check C, it's also a one. This seems to indicate to me that the problem has to do something with my input. 
if this weren't an input problem, I'd be reading a zero here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at my pull down resistors. And I noticed that actually my pull down resistors were touching. Actually, this resistor is kind of warm right now because there was a short between these two inputs, B and C. Once I move them out of the way, so they're no longer physically in contact with each other, I see that the LED turns off. Continuing to verify that the circuit works the way it should, I see now that it works perfectly fine. Sometimes we run into issues with our pull down resistors when they touch each other. So you can actually physically move them to another point on the breadboard if you've got more space somewhere else. But either way, make sure that they are physically separated from each other. Here is another incorrectly working two input OR gate. So you already see where I'm going with this. I'm going to be checking all of my inputs, all of my outputs, my power and my ground connection. I've already also verified that this is the correct chip. This is a 7432 chip. I'm going to check that my inputs are good, including the pin itself. Ah, look at this. When I probe my input here on my breadboard, I see that I'm neither getting a low or a high signal. When I switch the input to a 1, I'm getting a 1, but when the input's a 0, I'm not getting a 0. If we take a look at the pull-down resistor, we've made sure that one end is in the row of the breadboard that we expect, and the other end is in ground. Now the problem is, not that there's a resistor here, it's that it's the wrong resistor. This has color codes of brown, black, yellow, meaning that this is a 100 kilo ohm resistor. We want to use 220 ohm resistors, in this class at least. When I replace this with a 220 ohm resistor, you'll notice that our output becomes a zero and the circuit functions the way we expect it to. So in digital systems, 99.9% .9 of the time we're going to be using 220 ohm resistors, both as our pull downs and as our current limiting resistors. What happens if we use the wrong value for a current limiting resistor? I'm going to take that 100K and I'm going to put it in the path of my LED. And I notice that when I expect my LED to be on, that it isn't. This current limiting resistor is so high that it limits the current to such an extent that there's no longer enough current traveling through this device to light it up. So we want to make sure that we use 220s. There are going to be a couple situations where we use different values of resistors and I'm going to make it very clear when that happens. Otherwise, we're always interested in red, red, brown, 220 ohms. Here I have one of the most difficult problems to diagnose. This is a two input OR gate. Okay, so I'm going to do all of the checks that we've discussed before. I'm going to make sure it's the right chip. I look at it, I read that it's a 7432. That's as expected, that's an OR gate. Um, my LED is clearly working because it's on, so I know that that's not the problem. But I see that what happens is when both of my inputs are zero, that my LED is on. So this doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to do all of the checks that we did before. I'm gonna check my ground connection is good. That would be possibly a first thing I'd want to check because this indicates to me that something is wrong with maybe a ground connection. I then want to check my power connection. My power connection is good. So then what I want to do is I want to check my input signals. This input A is zero. On the breadboard it's a zero. That means that wire is good. And the pin is a zero, which means the pin isn't broken. Checking input B. The resistor is showing a zero, which means this is good. And then, oh, that was the wrong row. Now I'm actually probing the breadboard itself, and I'm getting nothing. I'm getting a floating input. That tells me that this wire is no good. In fact, check that out. I just pulled the wire out, and the little header actually stuck in the breadboard. And so I'm just going to replace the wire and see what happens. When I replace the wire, now I'm actually getting that low signal, which caused this LED to turn off again. So notice that this is a very difficult problem to figure out. It's usually not so obvious as our wire physically splitting into two. When these things break, they usually don't break in a catastrophic way. They usually break in a very subtle way. So the only way to really di diagnose and determine if it's a broken wire is to probe one end of the wire and the other end of the wire. 
If you're not getting the same signal on both ends of the wire, then the wire is broken. You might also notice that connections are loose and when you wiggle the wires a little bit, that things turn on again. I have to say that the breadboards that we use in lab have been used for quite a while. There's probably a lot of gunk and debris in them that is not simple to clean up. I wish I could give you bread, better breadboards, but we've got what we've got. In situations where there are loose wires, I always do my best when I'm checking them to be cognizant of that. But in situations like that, if you notice that possibly one row or one, one of the actual breadboards is consistently bad, try using the other one or move to a different spot on the breadboard. If you ever see melted sections on a breadboard, I would probably avoid using those sections. A lot of students have used the breadboards and a melted section means that something like taking this chip and inserting it upside down probably occurred in the past. What are some other common problems that I see? Other common problems that I see have to do with dip switches and the use of the breadboard itself. In order to get some more information about those specific issues, I highly encourage you to watch my videos about dip switches and the breadboard. Another thing that I see every now and again is a chip inserted upside down. I am not going to do that here because it would smell very bad and I would damage the breadboard and I would destroy the chip. Sometimes when I come and I check your circuits, what I do is I put my finger on the chip. What I'm doing is I'm checking to see if the chip is warm or cool. It should be pretty cool to the touch. If it's warm, that's an indication to me that you have a short circuit somewhere. If it's very, very hot, then very likely what happened was you've got the chip faced upside down. If we look at the internals of what happens when we actually plug in our chip upside down, we actually create a direct path from power to ground. We're creating a short with basically as much current as the power supply is able to provide going directly through the internals of our chip. Our chip is not accustomed to, nor should it have that much current running through it. That's where the bad smell and the melting part comes from. We want to make sure that our logic chips work. And for that reason, we want to make sure that all of the magic blue smoke stays inside the chip and does not come out at any time. All right, folks, that's again, not every single problem that I see with breadboards, but some of the most commonly seen things in my several years of teaching digital systems. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, the best way to get better at this is to practice, practice, practice. The reason that I'm so good at finding these problems is because I've made them myself so many times that it's easier for me to spot the errors quicker. By practicing and practicing and continuing to use good debugging tools like our logic probe, you're going to find that you're eventually going to get to a point where it's easier for you to figure out what the problems are early on. All right, folks, until next time, stay well.